so welcome everyone and I think uh, without further ado we can start with the first presenter so I'm happy to welcome um, Dipali Sina, uh, she's uh, an international expert on e-waste uh, since she works on the subject since many years and she's also uh, the managing director of uh, Sofies uh, in India. Sofies is a consulting firm that is specialized on, on those uh, uh, questions. So uh, Dipali, uh, you, have, you have the floor. Thanks everyone and thanks Charles uh, for the introduction. Uh, very good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are uh, logging in and joining. Uh, very happy to be participating here on uh, this virtual platform. I am not able to still share my screen, so if I just get the permission, yes, okay, now it's done. So what uh, my topic is, is uh, looking at uh, the new, newer uh, forms of e-waste uh, on uh, solar panels. This is a project that we've been doing for the last couple of years here in India. And I just thought I'll take these next five minutes to share a couple of insights uh, you know, from the work that we've been doing. So, you know, of course, uh, solar panels uh, are becoming very popular. There is a lot of uh, investment in solar technology and a lot of countries have uh, really made it possible through many various ways to deploy many. And India is one of those, uh, you know, it's got uh, the fifth largest uh, Install, install capacity of uh, solar PV. And of course, this has a lot of advantages, but it has, you know, the risks and, you know, we're particularly interested at the end of life, uh, what are the risks? And uh, we did some quick calculations and uh, we expect that in India, about four and a half to seven and a half million tons of PV panel will be generated, uh, you know, in the next upcoming 30 years or so. So it's not a small amount. It is, uh, you know, fairly equivalent to what we're doing in, in terms of electronic waste itself these days. So uh, it will become a big problem. And uh, that's that's what was the motivation to, you know, really look at solar panels, solar technologies to say, okay, there are a lot of positive environmental and social impacts that come out of it. And how can this be continued even at the end of life? Uh, you know, so the whole life cycle has a positive impact. And now that, uh, you know, at the end of life, it's leading to some contaminations and uh, looking at how can circular economy principles be applied to solar energy you know where are there opportunities to reuse panels refurbish panels and then of course uh, you know for those that are really broken can't be repaired uh, what are technologies to recycle them so with this uh, kind of intention we designed a first phase of a project which was really to collect uh, a first lot of uh, solar panels uh, you know, how do we get access to them? What is the cost? What are the, some of the technical aspects? And then uh, get, uh, you know, interested recyclers to really design and, and be able to uh, treat these panels or at least, you know, have a first chance to uh, understand what are some of the technical challenges as such. Uh, so because there was, uh, this was in 2018 when we started this, there was no technology uh, in India, uh, it still isn't uh, really advanced to be able to collect and recycle these kind of uh, products at the end of life. And then uh, once we had a little bit of traction, uh, uh, the first phase was, uh, was sponsored by Signify, and then together with Signify and the Dune Foundation from the Netherlands, uh, we extended this uh, pilot uh, to a second phase, which was uh, to first of all uh, look at uh, you know expanding the technology, the capacity to treat these panels, uh, look at uh, some LCAs, also look at how can we look at rural collections because so far we had looked mostly at collecting from utilities, so all in in, in one place, so a large volume, but uh, what would it mean if it was distributed? So uh, that was uh, you know one of the, uh, the additional elements of it which is going on right now in the current phase so yeah so this is just a quick uh, you know introduction to the pilot design where we want we set a target uh, we said okay we're going to design and fabricate these uh, uh, machines to be able to deframe the panels shred them crush them and sort them and we said that you know we would like to have a fairly high material recovery so that uh, we can say that there is you know as much circularity as possible and we had certain KPIs that uh, we said were important to track uh, through this whole 250 tons that were or will be processed. 
So yeah, just a few quick pictures. Uh, you're not getting into all the technical details to say that you know, now we've had uh, a chance to really design them, fabricate them, and have a first batch collected and uh, you know uh, operate the, the machines, test them out. Uh, you know from the technical perspective, uh, you know how does the material uh, get sorted, shredded, crushed, and uh, also you know get some some uh, material balance basically if we put in. You know these. Uh, uh, no, that's that's a mistake over there. Sorry, a typo. It's not four seven seven zero tons. It's four seven seven zero kgs. It's four point seven tons. Uh, so you know, if we had those two hundred odd panels, what was uh, you know coming out from them? And uh, we also send them for testing for material characterizations. Uh, you will send them to a couple of downstream uh, vendors who would be able to accept them to see what would be you know in their process acceptable or not. So, and that's where we are actually. So these are some of the opportunities we've tested and we're trying and we're having these discussions for these fractions, uh, you know, for the recovered material and where we would like to, of course, uh, you know, see that they, they have a downstream utilization. And uh, luckily in India, we do have manufacturers uh, for solar glass, for flat glass, etc. So it's, you know, uh, hope ideally it would be great if it can go back into the solar Panel manufacturing to really keep it circular and in the in a closed loop, but uh, of course for some uh, reasons it's uh, there are challenges yet. So we haven't still uh, achieved that uh, quality for uh, for the solar manufacturer to to accept it. So, so yeah, so that's an ongoing process. We're still working on that. Uh, we have another plant um, kind of coming through uh, with maybe a different uh, design that might help. Uh, yeah, take care of some of those. And, and we did a technical and a, a financial and economic baseline. So uh, really to look at what would, what would it cost to set up such a system for you know, collection, for recycling, for making sure that the end of life panels are uh, you know, treated properly. And uh, of course, these are based on only this one batch. So I would not say that these are like really fine costs, but it gives us a, a little bit of a you know, thumb in the air estimate. It's not you know, going to be 40% or 50% of the cost. It's, you know, between maybe two and five or 10% or something, you know, you have a little bit of a ballpark there. And what is really interesting is that the biggest cost is actually coming from the transport because, you know, of the size of the country, we had panels from all around going into one place and that was really adding to the cost. So if there are ways to optimize it, uh, you know, these costs can be brought down uh, quite significantly uh, when you have volume, when you have transport efficiencies, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, just to quite quickly conclude uh, and not overrun my time, uh, I, you know, wanted to just share a few observations um, from the, you know, panels that we have so far collected. So we have actually got access to about 150 tons already now, which are being processed at this pilot plant. Uh, you know, the second unit, as I mentioned, uh, will be commissioned soon, so we will have a, a chance to really compare two designs and uh, technologies in that sense. And uh, some of the things that we've come across in these two years or so is that there is more and more solar panel waste coming. We get more inquiries, uh, you know, for, from people who say, okay, we have uh, 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 panels uh, which need to be dismantled and, and disposed of. Uh, how can you help? Uh, the challenge is actually still in the mindset of the consumers because they expect to get some value from it, not realizing that it does take time and effort and cost to actually you know, collect them and treat them. So that's still something that is not fully understood. Uh, as I mentioned, like logistics are really, really one of the biggest cost aspects still, uh, you know, to be able to load and uh, unload and dismantle and treat are less than, you know, the whole cost of transportation. Um, and what we also found is that, you know, the composition is very variable. So, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to know exactly uh, if you have two different batches, you will have a a, a, a kind of a similar composition of the fraction. So that's something that we still need to figure out what would be a normalized uh, kind of material composition because it's important for the downstream vendors. You know, they do not like to have impurities, uh, which will be then contaminants. So uh, those are things that we need to still work on. It's not as easy as just, you know, shredding and, and uh, uh, sorting, but it does need to be cleaned quite well. And uh, definitely there will be some additional financing, uh, you know, ideally through an EPR mechanism uh, that will be needed. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, it's not a lot uh, from our 
quick estimates, it doesn't mean it's going to become, uh, you know, a large cost burden. But if the if the industry starts early, it can, you know, really uh, be done without any pain in that sense. So that was just a quick, quick um, overview of our project. I hope I kept it in time, Charles, and not overstay my welcome. Uh, but happy to answer questions, uh, you know, later, of course. And you have my email there. Uh, you know, we've done this, uh, this is my colleague Ankit, who's also worked a lot on this project. So you could reach out to either of us and happy to share more. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Dipali, also for this uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, maybe so everyone can even already now uh, write their questions in, in the WOVA chat and we will discuss that all together after the, the three other presentations. Maybe just one little question from my side or maybe let's keep everything for later. Okay, uh, sorry, but thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I think we can go to the next presentation. So let me present uh, Heinz Bernie, who is uh, uh, the head of the research group uh, CARE at EMPA in Switzerland and uh, also uh, my boss. So I will do a very, very uh, good presentation of him. I think if I want to keep my job, maybe. And um, so Heinz Bernie is a longtime expert in uh, e-waste recycling in Switzerland and is involved since the very beginning uh, in the uh, take back scheme and financing scheme of, of uh, electronics recycling in Switzerland. So uh, Heinz, uh, you can take the mic. Thank you very much. I think you passed the slides, no? Yes? Can you hear me? Can you pass to the next slide, please? Yes, we can hear you. And uh, so as far I, as I've I, seen, you have all the slides. Or should I share my screen? You, you, uh, no, 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 it's someone from the WRF will pass the slide now. As far uh, as I understand, it's like this, yes. Yeah. So please, the, the title slide. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So my presentation will look into the future of a project which we are just about to start. And you can also see that my colleague Charles and Andrea Verli are leading this project actually, and I'm head of that group. And we are looking into the performance indicators for assessing circularity and recycling. That is extremely important in order to really go into the right direction. Uh, you have to know how and where to measure what. And, and this is the, the content of our project. Next slide, please. So the, we, if uh, we man, we is uh, recycled. There are basically two goals. You want to recycle, of course, materials as much as possible and the uh, retention of a value, and you want to minimize the risks and 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 to depollute the the e waste. These are two main goals. And how can you reach them? You have to concentrate and to segregate. That's also why the approach is called ECONSEC. So you concentrate valuable substances into fractions where you can really easily recover them. And hazardous substances also have to be concentrated and segregated into fractions where they can be controlled and disposed of safely. So if we need indicators to assess the performance of recycling companies in this respect, we need to have indicators which, which assess uh, these two goals or the, the, the progress against these two goals. Next slide, please. So what is assessed today? Uh, basically, there are two main uh, indicators. On the recovery side, we have recycling recovery rates, which we, which we calculate when we do batch testing in recycling companies as part of our auditing activities. And the other side, we have the pollution targets. We have target values. We have mass balance or limit values in relevant fractions. So these two uh, indicators, different indicators in these two areas are used. And the question is then, are we really reaching a circular economy with this framework? Next slide. Uh, we did a study some years ago uh, in Switzerland on a large recycling plant uh, together with other companies. And it's a fact that you, you know, as soon as you shred material, you have a, a separation of the elements into different fractions, as you can see here. So uh, the, the valuable fractions are not always where you want them to be. You have them sometimes in fractions where they are not recovered, where they cannot be recovered. And the same is true for, uh, for hazardous fractions. So the, 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 the challenge is really to, to direct your fractions into the right, uh, uh, or to direct your material into the right fractions and then to recover it uh, uh, safely. Next slide. 
how do we do that today uh, with recycling and recovery targets? I mentioned that um, this is, uh, has uh, several disadvantages because we only look into the mass rich mass uh, fractions, which are aluminum, uh, copper and iron on the, on the level of metals and of course plastics. We don't look into the uh, critical metals, so we, we can have no idea if these are well recovered, except of those who are uh, high value, have a high value like gold, for example. Then, of course, if we calculate such a target, or if we, if, we, if we compare the performance of a company against such a target, it's clear that the input material is extremely important. You cannot have the same target value for the same input material, but it's applied like this all over Europe in other countries too. And on the other hand, you also do not see the environmental benefits of recovering different metals. It could be that some of the metals, as you know, will have uh, another benefit, a higher benefit, like copper, for example, in comparison to iron. So this is an aspect which is not uh, considered yet. You can see that in the chart that uh, the same company can have very different recycling levels, performances uh, with the same technology. Next one. Looking into the uh, into the targets which we have on the side of the pollutants. We have, for example, for PCB, we have a value of 50 ppm in the uh, smallest non-metallic me uh, mechanical treatment fraction, which means that below 50 it's good and above 50 it's, it's bad. So bad could be those who concentrate it in the right fraction, satellite fraction, which is the one which is mostly incinerated, and good could be those who dilute such a, such a, a contaminant in different fractions. So looking at only at the mass fraction is not sufficient. You need to know exactly where the loads are, the major loads. And you can see in the chart that shredder light fraction has 20 grams in that case with 2,000 kilos. Dust has 1.2 grams and plastic with 10,000 kilo in this example. And just 5 ppm of PCB could have 50 grams of PCB. So you don't consider that in, your, in, your, uh, in this indicator. Next one. So our project looks into how, how can we assess the circularity and retreatment better. We are convinced that there is a, a large room for improvement. Uh, we have to look not only into the mass uh, rich uh, fractions and the, and, and the mass rich uh, materials. We have only also to consider critical technical metals, for example. We have also to see how good uh, segregation is taking place and how good pollutants are controlled. And we have to maximize the environmental benefits in all the treatments. So it's not possible to go for all of the materials, but we need to know which materials have a priority. The result of this project will end up in a Swiss new Swiss regulation uh, to the requirements for a circular economy in we in we management. So this project will be finished in 2023 and hopefully in the next World Resources Forum we can present the results, but hopefully my presentation has created some interest and some curiosity of some of the participants in this uh, scientific session. Thank you very much. Next one, last one. Thank you very much, Heinz, for this very interesting presentation. And uh, uh, so, as before, like write your questions in, in the chat, uh, remember them and we will discuss uh, at the end. So now directly with the next presentation, uh, welcome to uh, Gada Morni. Uh, Gada is um, um, the project coordinator in the SHRI project, which is uh, uh, for sustainable recycling industries um, uh, at the Center for uh, Environmental and Development uh, for the Arab region. Um, and Europe. Sorry, in, in Europe. No, sorry, I just like was cut. One second. Yes, and Europe uh, in Egypt. Yes. So welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm glad to be here and taking part in the WRF 2021. Uh, I'll be speaking today about towards circular electronics in Egypt. Next, please. Oh, uh, even more next. <laughs> okay, uh, according the last published global e-waste monitor for 2020 has established that there are 53.6 million tons uh, globally uh, e-waste generated in 2019. And, and it also has, the research has stated that in less than 10 years, it will increase by almost 50% to become 74.7 million tons. And in fact, Egypt is one of the top countries in Africa for generating e-waste. The whole uh, the country, Egypt, the 
uh, through the SDGs 2030 and uh, in most of the uh, African countries, we're going uh, to become a sustainable city and a sustainable e-smart city to develop, to provide for the services, for the several services uh, through the tra digitalization transformation. So, uh, next please. So this of course will generate even more e-waste. As you all know, electronic waste life cycle takes two paths. It either goes through the refurbishment reuse and where it's re-injected into the economy again, uh, or it goes through metal recovery, sorting, recycling, and metal extraction. Next, please. Egypt has a major presidential uh, digital transformation program with uh, e-waste management, actually, which this is a good news to be as one of the five pillars of this program. This is where the Shri is supporting the Egyptian government. And they've chosen the refurbishment program to inject into the, uh, to inject back all the equipment into the digital transformation to better utilize its budget. So they go, they create jobs, and at the same time, they uh, inject into the, the, I mean, help with the government uh, funds. Uh, through our with our uh, German partners, actually a few years back, we've done a research, and it was found that urban mining or the extraction of precious metals like gold, silver, and platinum, and so on, in in five years would generate nine tons. If all, of course, equipment were collected, would generate nine tons, equivalent to 500 million USD. However, the official gold mine in Egypt, it's called the Sukkari, generates five tons in five years. So you can see the benefits of uh, metal extraction. Next. So as I told you that Egypt has gone into the refurbishment uh, concept and reuse of uh, uh, electronic uh, end of life governmental organization. They, this center, they actually it's in process and uh, the infrastructure is there and they're processing it right now, is responsible for the collection of used end of life governmental equipment. The concept will be basically focusing on the refurbishment of operable components of the used governmental equipment, where it could be used whether as components or to rebuild new equipment and be injected again into the digitalization cycle. This has the objective of saving governmental funds and uh, uh, that, that it will be used to refurbish and make use of refurbished equipment to serve the purpose required by the relevant uh, governmental entity. This, this, uh, this refurbishment or a collection refurbishment uh, center has also another objective, other than uh, injecting back refurbished equipment into digital transformation, it's to provide the formal accredited recyclers in Egypt with the necessary raw material of recyclable e-waste which in, of course will, 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 will be in parallel nurturing the collective bargaining power of small companies working in the form of clusters through more common collaborative platforms. The e-waste will be dispensed to the recyclers, the accredited recyclers, and here the accredited recyclers are accredited by the Ministry of Environment, and the whole process of the recycling is audited and following the rules and regulation of the Ministry of Environment. Um, and the good news is we had a new law uh, that was issued last year, tw uh, in year 2020, no law number 202, which governs in, uh, the e-waste management process. Next, please. Actually, this is the, I just wanted to share with you what this collection and refurbishment center uh, looks like. It's, uh, it's actually the, the outer or the infrastructure is, uh, is already there. And uh, the Ministry of Communication Information Technology, who have the ownership of this uh, center, have already embarked, as you see, on the internal design of the place. And with the aim of, um, I mean, actually, it has two aims uh, hosting uh, a second round of e waste recycling entrepreneurship, supporting, supporting in the intervention consequent with the first track of the three projects, which we already did the, one of those entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, program and also given that the education is a leverage to spur the development of recycling industry in Egypt this center also will be providing professional training uh, uh, through our uh, national e-waste trainee program that was developed also by Shri and also and this has the objective of institutionalizing the e-waste 
training program in, uh, in universities and uh, research centers and so on. So this center actually is uh, not only going to be a collection refurbishment, providing recyclers with uh, the raw material, but also as a training and capacity building center. Thank you. This is, this, that was the last uh, presentation. I think I'm well beyond the below five minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for this uh, interesting presentation. And uh, so as before, same story, uh, write down your questions and uh, we will uh, jump to the next presentation. So please welcome uh, Jamie Alberto Romero Infante, who is a professor in the Universidad El Bosque in Colombia and also the editor in chief of the technology magazine of the engineering faculty. Um, yes, so you have the floor, welcome. Good, good morning everyone here, good, good evening there. Uh, I am here in Bogota and I am delighted for, for having this presentation, how to reverse the unsustainable behavior in the electronics chemical Latin American and Caribbean industry in 2000. 20,001. Um, the context of the presentation uh, in Latin America, uh, the chemical and electronic industry, uh, changing the habits of the people, consumers here in the, in the industry, in the region. Uh, the institutions involved are UNEP and Universidad del Bosque. And the method that we follow was the uh, application of one survey in the all actors between all the actors that we have in the re in the region uh, in order to understand how they are um, understanding the cycle the life cycle method of symbiotic uh, approach for having the reduce of the waste and the and to re re recover the the materials that we have in the industry next please Next slide, please. Okay, uh, the purpose of this is to do a type of, of roadmap for having the transition to a circular economy in the, in the region uh, for this industry. Um, the, the study frame is a, 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 a survey that we proposed, uh, but some uh, kind of changing uh, habits and to promote the uh, habits habits for for having as a sustainable consumption of this uh, industry these consumers uh, we need to understand that the the people um, uh, take the life cycle assessment uh, understanding that the the life cycle is not ending at the end of the service of the product, but we have to connect other industries for having the symbiosis, industrial symbiosis, by means of understanding uh, by, for the people, for, for the consumers, how they know, how they perceive, how they value, how are committed with the, the problem and how, how they are responsible or they feel that they are responsible for having a better results in the, in the industry. This is the symbiotic cycle that we have to change, to propose the change of the behavior by a cleaner behavior, uh, by cleaner modalities of the, of the industry. The platform, the circularity platform have uh, maintained the highest va possible value of the materials, to entire value chain in more important that is more important uh, that each of the each, its individual stage, all the stakeholders are committed to changing the system, or uh, the life cycle thinking is important identification of the strategy points, and by means of this work we have to and un understand and the consumers have to understand that the economic growth 
has to be decoupling from the increasing of the environmental impact. So we have to recycle, reduce the design by, by means of the design from the extraction to the manufacturing, uh, to the distribution by means of the of one kind of distribution, uh, clean it uh, by energy, uh, uh, solar energy or electronic or electric energy for the distribution and to consumption, the the way in which the the consumers uses the products has to be uh, focused on the refor refurbish repairing, reuse, and remanufacturing for having a uh, recovering the value. The e-waste of Latin America, we, have, we understand, we find out that uh, uh, is in this, in these tons, this is ton metric tons. Uh, it's very important to having this, but uh, is is the way, the, the moment is to understand how we can recover this waste mm, in in latin america and caribbean we have the we waste uh, generated the the kilotons per capita and here are we have the stakeholders the stakeholder here are in these countries uh, we we do we did the 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 research in argentina brazil colombia Mexico, Mexico and Uruguay, and we take out some data from Ecuador. The, the, the stakeholders are mapping here and we have uh, this, this uh, information. The method- so, Sorry, a um, little heads up about the time. Uh, we, we have to start the discussion in one minute. So okay. just to so, let you know, sorry so about that. Jaime, okay. perhaps, perhaps you can just go to the results. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. The survey of results, uh, these, these are the, the results, the benefits of the circular economy, the obstacles of the development in circular economy, and the surveys of the in education and the life cycle management hazards. The, the concluding remarks are that we have to uh, collect the, 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 the waste, that the people has to understand that some activities has to be done uh, by connecting other industries in order to have the recycling process uh, more dynamic and more um, uh, general, general in, in general in, in more industries. The role of the public policy and the government in these environments are cru is crucial. The regulatory framework must allow for a welcome to each of the parties involved in the in electronic and uh, is long term the the the, the rep of principles of Europe. the encourage of the population to participate in this process uh, this is not only for other countries in other continents but for having here in latin america the strategy to be a transparent and effective information campaigns in order to have best practice that people has to encourage and to commitment or, or with this with this type of work thank you we have the the focus of, on on one next uh, event the um, environmental management uh, forums uh, and circular economy in order to in 12th november to have a, 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 a meeting for experts in order to analyze the recommendations for action and a roadmap for the transition to a circular economy in electronic sectors in, in, in uh, the region from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. in the next 12th of November, we will have the expert. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for all those presentations. So I think we can directly jump uh, in the discussion. So Terry, uh, let you the the floor um, yeah okay so thank <laughs> thank you so i think what we'll do then is that we'll move on we can either do we'll do the poll so we do the poll first or should we do the, the, the discussions is it the discussions yeah okay all right so um so well thanks um to everybody and i think probably first of all let's just give a a virtual <laughs> round of applause <laughs> to all the 
the, to all of the, the, the speakers. Um, you know, you know, I, I appreciate the, the effort certainly that went into putting the presentations together. So um, thank you. Um, <laughs> The virtual applause. So um, we'll move on to questions. So I mean, if, there's, if there are any um, questions, as, as Charles says, you can pop them into the chat. Um, and so we can do that. But in, in the meantime, um, I've got a few, um, a few questions myself so while we wait for that. So um, Dipali, so one of the things that you, you mentioned was as regard to the collection from from rural rural communities and so i just wanted to to get a sense from you about you know some of the issues there and and how you can sort of went about overcoming some of those challenges because i think that would be quite quite interesting for you in terms of your rural um, collection uh, no, thanks for that question, Terry. It's really something that uh, we are still actually uh, trying to find the answer to. So we have uh, been obviously looking at the whole off-grid space uh, because that's where a lot of these products, a lot of these uh, installations are. And uh, you know, we've done a kind of a mapping uh, in the country where there is more off-grid, off-take, or where there are more installations. And uh, now looking at partners, how we can really uh, go into those rural areas to be able to collect them, uh, aggregate them, and then transport them. So there are quite interesting players. There are you know, companies that really specialize on this last mile in the rural context uh, to more distribute products. So we are looking at how can we use those logistic networks to also bring back products, uh, you know, maybe for repair, maybe for recycling. Um, but yeah, there, there needs to be some sort of interface. So we're really looking at that. So I don't have an answer yet. But like Heinz, I hope uh, by 2023 to have some uh, really good uh, results to show over <laughs> there. <laughs> it's never, it's never an easy answer. So. Um, Charles? Yeah. Yes, um, I also have a question for you, uh, Dipali. So as you showed, there is, as in other places in the world, a, a boom in electro, uh, like in photovoltaic electricity production in, in India. And I was wondering, since those, those panels, they have quite a long uh, lifetime, they're often even longer than expected. Um, are you expecting a photovoltaic uh, tsunami in the next uh, few years or decades? Uh, and is the capacity, is there capacity to, to manage all this uh, new uh, waste in the future, both uh, in, in, the, in the industrial sense, but also economical sense, since I guess uh, if there is much more product, the, the price of, of the, the, the secondary materials will also, might also drop. So what are your thoughts about, about the future and about the future mass flows? So I, I'll try and break it up into several parts, uh, you know, your question, Charles. So in terms of the volumes, definitely, I mean, the way the installations have happened, uh, you know, it's gone really exponential. India is probably not as bad if you look at China or Vietnam even, actually. You know, Vietnam went from like less than 100 um, megahertz to a few gigahertz in the space of two years or something like this. So, uh, so there is a lot of panels being laid out over there. And you're right, the panels do have a very long life. But that's not the only component. You know, you have the panels, but you also have electronics, you also have products, you also have battery. So you might have three battery cycles while you have one panel cycle. So when you're looking at it from a full product life cycle, you have to take into that uh, consideration as well. So that's one thing. There's definitely going to be a lot of, you know, volume of waste. Uh, there is going to be, it's also distributed across the country. It's very diffused. So it's in the rural areas, it's in industrial, uh, it's in commercial, it's in residential areas. So uh, that's, you know, one of the big challenges to like really aggregate it well. And then of course the technology is still very much uh, evolving. You know, it's not so advanced yet. I mean, definitely not in India. It does, it's just no current recycler who's able to treat it properly yet. So I think, you know, right now we're still at a very nascent stage where you are getting these older panels which have been installed now. 10, 15, 20 years ago. And of course, there are those that get damaged during installation, uh, you know, for, you know, weather reasons, etc. So, yeah, so I think we have now a kind of a enough uh, uh, volume of panels in the waste stream to be starting to trial and pilot things. And then, of course, it's going to go grow quite quickly. 
hope that was uh, yeah. at least answering some of those questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks very much, Ipali. Um, Hannah, you had a, a question quickly? Yes, I wanted to ask to the Pali if you have the possibility to extend the industry to other continents, for example, in, in Latin America, we need to to develop some productions uh, uh, as we have in the cultural uh, insert of, of this activity here, for example, in Colombia, that we have to do some some uh, industry, some enterprises that uh, acts against the, the 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 war that we had some uh, years ago, some few years ago. How do you think about it? I mean, in the context of uh, solar energy, uh, you know, from uh, yeah, what we we are looking at is looking at panels which can be repurposed as well. So there are business opportunities to really look at panels, especially from utilities, which are re, um, they call it repowering, so changing panels. So there are some opportunities to create jobs. Uh, there are, you know, it's uh, skill building that needs to be done. And I think these can be transferred. You know, it's, it's not, I would say, so, uh, you know, technically demanding and capital intensive. So, I think definitely once we have a little bit better visibility right now, this is still very, very early stage, you know, really, you know, we, we started in 2018, we were just getting the whole design, etc. together in 2019. And for the last year and a half, we haven't been able to do much because of the pandemic. So it's really, you know, only, yeah, very early stages, but uh, happy to keep in touch and share more, of course. So. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Jaime, as you as you have the floor, I have a question for you. <laughs> um, kind of, kind of under so, I mean, what if you had two two points that you could make as lessons learned for for other regions from your experience in terms of behavior change? What would they be? So, what what would be two two lessons learned for you that other um, regions could utilize in terms of behavior? I think that the way in which we can change the, 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 the behavior of the, of the consumers and the producers is to make, to understand that they have, they are part of a cycle, not part of a consumption. Uh, when we have something here in our hands, we have to understand that we have the possibility to begin with another cycle, productive cycle. So we always think that we have to have the waste and to put the waste, waste in, the, in the garbage and forget it. And we have to change this point. We have to change this mind uh, in, internally in order to understand that we can be useful for other um, cycle and to, to have a better way of being, uh, the, the, not only in our products, but in our ourselves. We have to understand that we are changing and we have to change and we have to understand that our productivity is missing if we have all, uh, the, the waste. The waste are not, is not excess existence. We have the experience with an indigenous some indigenous communities. In the, these communities here in the, for example, these mountains that you see in the, my background, in, the, in those mountains are indigenous cultures. Those are the black mountains in the back part of Bogota. And with a beautiful lakes, we are, are, there are some communities that I, they understand that no waste is possible no waste are produced by them. And they are thinking that all the things that they have in their hands has to be useful and has to be used. And the, the boys and the girls, the, the, the children that we have in the, this, those communities are inside the nature. So are they are well, part of the I, Okay, but thank I know that we, I know you could probably go on for 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 many for quite long, but we kind of run out of time. So we want to get to a, a few more questions, particularly for Gada. <laughs> yeah. 
So thank you very much. And then we want to get to the poll. So Charles, you said that there's a question. Is it for Gada or? or for there, is, there, there, there is a question from the chat. So the question I, I read it out loud. Hines? Uh, for Heinz here. I want to ask yeah, okay. about the key performance indicators generated in the presentation against what exactly in the presentation against what exactly and how you choose those uh, one based on your circular circular economy e-waste um so so yeah what what would be i guess uh, how i understand it is what 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 kind of indicators uh, do you have examples uh, of those kpis that you could be used on e-waste um is how i understand this question if that makes sense Yes, uh, thank you. I, I gave already a short uh, response in the chat also. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, I wrote there that we look more into the losses of selected raw materials. So we try to prioritize uh, raw materials. I mean, that's just one of the approaches which we are looking into more deeply. Of course, there will be others, but one is maybe one of the most interesting one is how to, to see where in a process chain, um, the we, which is processing we, where do we have the, the major losses? and which environmental impacts are somehow uh, related to these losses. So to see also which metals do you lose uh, because you cannot recover them because they end up in a process where they are lost. Either they are ending up in a slag or they are just not recovered and end up in dust or whatever. So that will be one of the approaches for the valuable fractions. And for the, the other fractions, for the hazardous fractions, we probably look into the question of the load, I mean, not so much in the question of limit values, because limit values are dangerous, because they depend a lot on, of course, on the, on the quantity of material where they are measured. So we will go into more of the load and to see where the load is uh, somehow, uh, where you can find a major load of certain of the pollutants. And this is not, not necessarily the, the smallest non-metallic treatment fraction, like the residue of the shredder, for example. It can be also another fraction, and that we will look into also. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Then, so I've got one one last question then for for Gada. Um, so I mean, I mean, fantastic in terms of the the development of the center. So what what would you what would you kind of advise suggest uh, to others that might be looking to develop a, a similar center? What advice? You mean you mean develop a similar center in a different in another country? Yes, in, uh, a, in another country. Yeah. Well, I think it's 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 a very good model. It's a very good uh, business model because uh, and it it came from the awareness and and um, uh, of the government of the Ministry of Communication Information Technology, and they saw the benefit in making use of the refurbished or reuse of equipment to uh, save uh, the uh, on governmental funds. So, and I think this is a very good business model that could be used in a lot of developing countries because this um, fund saving is very economical and, and, and at the same time it serves the circular economy purpose and by injecting all these equipment or components. I mean, they don't have to be equipment, but they could also be components. And that will ensure also that whatever goes to recycling is completely uh, recyclable. And uh, whatever is uh, usable is uh, completely utilized. So I think it's a very good business model for developing countries and for saving funds and uh, working towards circular economy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think probably just left for me um, um, to, to say thanks again to, to our, our presenters and, and thanks to the audience for, for joining us. Uh, it's been a Quite, a, quite an interesting and, and enlightening um, present four presentations. Um, and if Charles wants to say something to close. So yeah, thank you everyone. Uh, it was very interesting. And also thank you for, uh, for the work and preparation. And, and uh, we've learned a lot today, I guess, I think. So thank you for that. And uh, see you on the next one. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Thank Bye. You. Bye. 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 Bye.